I mean, we're at the cusp of the culmination of human history and the redemption of mankind. I think we're entering into these days. All right, as you can, oh, don't do that. As you can, uh, as you can tell, airplane mode, I am not in my studio. And so I'm down here in South Texas and I recorded this earlier today and it was uh, just gorgeous outside. It wasn't this back, you know, it's awesome room that I'm in, but um, not great for recording, but um, nice, great, nice place. Some friends of mine, but you know, the trees and the look throughout the window, which is just right over there. It was just gorgeous, but I did not like the way the video turned out. I just, there's way too way too much to cover. So anyway, I'm hoping to do three or four, five, six. I'm hoping to finish our whole eschatology series while I'm down here this week. So we'll just see, uh, we'll just see how that goes. But um, all right, well, this is Daniel's 70 weeks. And uh, let's, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's jump into it. I wanna give you, and I just, I just kept cutting this thing down because and it's not that it's, I mean, it was an hour long video, first off, which is, the time is, I guess, irrelevant. You can watch it in chunks. But I mean, it's just it, too much. It was way too much information. And so I just decided to go ahead and trim it down and give you just, give you some things to study. Because at the end of the day, um, honestly, you're gonna have to study. You're gonna have to dig in and do some research and, and all of that. So um, I decided to give you a lot of the information and let you kind of, you know, wheedle it out yourself rather than just listen to me drone on. I was falling asleep to myself. So a um, couple things, if you have, have a pen and paper, I want you to write, I want you to write this stuff down and, and then, or is there such a thing as pen and paper anymore? Um, you can type this stuff out, put notes in your phone, something. So let me give you first and foremost, we're going to do this throughout the video, but let me give you first and foremost, some reading material. You ready? Jeremiah chapters 25 and 29, the first 14 verses of those chapters, verses one through 14. Strange enough, um, both in chapter 25 and 29, pertinent material for Daniel's 70 weeks are in those verses. So chapter 25 and 29, verses one through 14. And those are prophecies concerning Israel going into captivity into Babylon. And so, um, those are good sections of Jeremiah's book to familiarize yourself with. Second Chronicles chapter 36, just a few verses, verses 17 through 21. Second Chronicles 36, 17 through 21. Um, there's three places in Leviticus. Really, it's chapters 20 through 26. But, you know, there's a lot there. So if you read Leviticus 20 through 22, um, those chapters 20, 21, 22, um, that's crazy. You're going to flip when you read through that. Like that's all the punishment stuff. God's like, you know, if you, if you, you know, sin, if you do these kinds of things, I'm kicking you out. I'm kicking you out of the land. And then uh, Leviticus 25, the first seven verses and Leviticus 26 verses 33, 34, and 35. Now, the reason I want you to read Jeremiah, second Chronicles and those Leviticus chapters it's not like God just got up one day and was like, all right, Israel, I've had enough. You're out of here. It wasn't that. It was, it was like Moses and Joshua, you know, having them come into, you know, commitment and covenant with God, knowing the consequences if they sinned against the land and against God. God's, you know, one of the primary factors of this whole series kind of the foundations of what we've been talking about, the land does not belong to Israel. They are stewards of the land. The land belongs to Jesus, the Messiah. And when he comes back, he's gonna take back the land. So they were just stewards of it. And when they were poor stewards of it and they lived in rebellion, God kicked them out, saved a remnant, bought a remnant back and said, don't do what your parents did. Okay. That's basically what they did. So Jeremiah, Second Chronicles, Leviticus, there's other places as well. But those are really key passages in knowing why, why the people of Israel were cast out of the land and why uh, it was 70 years. 
why it was a 70 year time period. And I'm not going to go into all the stuff I want to go into. You're going to have to study it yourself that it was over a period of 490 years that they, they didn't let the land rest. And that's why they were kicked out. And so I'm not going to go through all that because it'll take forever. But go back and read all of that. That's really important. Some other reading I want you to become familiarized with is uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. They're short, uh, but very important. Of course, Daniel. And then um, I want to go ahead and give you uh, some, some non-biblical reading. Um, Sir Robert Anderson's book, The Coming Prince. Uh, he's he, him and, if I still have it in here, and uh, Harold Honer, H-O-E-H-N-E-R, Harold H-O-E-H-N-E-R, um, Harold and Sir Robert Anderson um, did the groundbreaking work on the chronology, um, on the chronology of of uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel and the time frame of Israel coming back into the land and and all that time from that time uh, after the Babylonian captivity, when they go back into the land until the birth of Jesus, life of Jesus and death of Jesus. So those two guys are really important. So those are two guys, uh, Harold Hohner, <laughs> I hope I'm saying that right, and Sir Robert Anderson, specifically his book, The Coming Prince. And then, of course, as always, I love Gail Evers. You're awesome, Gail. And if you would like to follow her um, her, her course on Daniel, I think it's outstanding. John Callahan, also at Never Thirsty, I think it's neverthirsty.com. Um, he does a really good job. I really like him. I haven't vetted him fully, um, but like everything that he's done, because he does a lot of stuff, but his, his, uh, his review of the Daniel 70 weeks and looking at some of the academic material and scholarly material on what we're studying today, uh, is really good. So those are the passages. Those are the people. That's extracurricular uh, stuff. Uh, that's that's uh, extracurricular. That's extra stuff I want you guys to, to study and read. All right, Daniel chapter nine, you ready? Seven minutes. I'm doing good so far. Seven minutes, and now we're going to get into Daniel chapter nine. There are basically, uh, my word, I think I, 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 I knocked this out. We're going to take it in chunks. So we're going to look at chapter nine of Daniel. This is where the Daniel seven to week stuff is. Get a little bit of context verses one through 19. Let's just look at the beginning part of the chapter first, and then we'll go into verses 20 through 27. All right. The first 19 verses, there's a lot here um, that, that you need to get in terms of context. Um, with the Babylonian captivity, um, you understand 70 years, there's a lot that has happened. Um, they go into captivity, Israel goes into captivity, you know, into Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. When they come out of captivity, Babylon has been defeated. And now you have the Medo-Persian, which is the Persian and Medes come together to form an empire. And they're the next major world dominating empire at that time. Uh, they are now ruling. So first Babylon, then Medo-Persia. So they go into exile, Babylon out of exile under Medo-Persia. And so there's a lot of time, 70 years. Daniel's an old man at this point. He went in as a young man, most scholars suggest in his 80s at least, um, probably mid 80s. And uh, there, there's just been a lot of time. There's a lot of kings. There's a lot of rulers or a lot of appointees, um, different names you're going to familiarize yourself with. I, I went through that in the first video and it was, <laughs> it was too long. So I'm not going to go all through that. So you're going to have to go through kind of, uh, you know, reading the stuff that I'm reading, you're going to get a good handle on it. Okay. So, um, uh, but at the beginning of the chapter, here's where we pick it up. Daniel basically picks up one of Jeremiah's letters. There's a variety of letters that the, the book of Jeremiah is a compilation of his letters, um, both penned by him and, and probably some supplemental material, but it's all, you know, authorized. Um, Jeremiah, unlike Daniel, unlike Ezekiel, um, unlike most of Israel, uh, Jer uh, Jeremiah did not go into captivity. Um, after there were three deportations, uh, starting, I think, in 605 BC, all the way down to 586 when, when everything was devastated. Um, 
three different deportations into Babylon. Jeremiah did not end up going. He kind of took the remainder of the casualties, people that were left and went to Egypt and still wrote letters uh, from Egypt and kind of smuggled those into Babylon. So um, Daniel had to sift through all this. It wasn't like just one big book and Daniel forgot what he's reading. So he runs across this portion of the collection of writings of Jeremiah. And you read in verse two that he understands from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. And so he looks at his clock and he's like, wow, hey, we're getting ready to go home. So the rest of the chapter, beginning at verse three, where it reads, so I turned to the Lord, um, all the way down through verse 19, he begins to cry out and he's repenting. He's, he's interceding for Israel. He's reminding God of the covenant. And of course, Daniel is just awesome. And so that that's chapter nine, verses one through 19. And there's a ton in those verses that I'd love for you to go through. The context is beautiful. The relationship with Jeremiah and what he contributed to Israel, the encouragement, them settling in the land, the implications of the people of God on Babylon. And then even in the Persian uh, empire was just incredible. Um, you know, the linkage, even we see even the influence up to Jesus day where you have three wise men. Well, where else do we know about wise men in scripture? Daniel was among the wise men. He influenced all the wise men. He, he literally influenced an entire world influencing empire. And uh, they had to come to Israel at the beginning of Christ's birth and remind them, you know, of things they should not have been reminded of. Uh, so there's a lot there in these first 19 verses and just, Love for you to familiarize yourself with it and, and dig in there. But this is where he realizes the 70 years are up and they're going back into the land. Uh, so the punishment has ended. When you come into chapter, uh, of course, nine, but verses 20 through 27, there is more to the story than them just going back to the land and picking up where they left off. This is where Gabriel comes in. Gabriel's pretty consistent in the, the book of Daniel. I'm convinced he's the main guy that comes to Daniel. He's not always named, but he comes here and um, he begins in verses 20, 21, 22, and 23 saying, hey, Daniel, you're awesome. I've come to give you insight. This is important. I'm going to take two seconds here. Prophecy is a really, 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 really big deal. Biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy about the end of days is a big deal. You can say, why? Because it's in the Bible. <laughs> I, I run into people who are like, oh, prophecy, you know, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen. That is, that's so sad. Um, there, there, there's more, I, I've ran across some studies. I've never actually like worked it out myself, but I run across some studies like a third of the Bible is prophecy. God wants us to know the seasons in which we are living. One of the fundamentals on this channel, if you've ever watched me for any extended period of time, prophecy, specifically biblical prophecy, was never given so that we would know when something would happen. It was given so that when it happened, we would know that it happened. Um, Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 says this several times, when you see this, do that. So he's telling them in advance. In fact, he even says, see, I've told you things be these things before they happen. So he's not telling you when they're gonna happen. He tells you before they're gonna happen, that's prophecy, so that when they do happen, you will know what to do. So it's, it's a subtle difference, but it's important. Prophecy wasn't given so you would know when. Jesus doesn't know when. Jesus does not know when he's coming back, okay? Only the Father knows the details of time. But God lets us know along the way, because he wants us to be aware, when you see these events, these prophetic events that I told you are going to come to pass, when these come to pass, do this. Okay? So that's what prophecy is. So these, this, this time frame of, of Daniel's, what we come to call 70 weeks, uh, it's just, it's another time piece that God gives us, wanting us to know what's taking place. I believe, I mean, we're at the cusp of the culmination of human history and the redemption of mankind. I think we're entering into these days, maybe not tomorrow, but the idea that, oh, they're a hundred years down the road. I do not buy that. I do not buy that. 
Israel, 1948 was a timepiece, but I'm not gonna get distracted, okay? So, um, but this is a super significant portion of scripture. So there are several things we're gonna have to look at. And again, verses 20 down through verse 23 is Gabriel saying, here it is, God wants me to tell you this, write it down. That's super important, okay? So you come down into verse 24, and this is where we're gonna pick it up. Um, and there are several parts to this. Um, and let me go ahead and read verse 24. We're going to go down through verse 24, 25, 26, and 27. You ready? It's going to be fun. Verse 24. Seventy sevens. We're not going to get to what that means till because there's got to go in order. Are decreed for your people and your holy city. For this purpose, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, meaning that's done, and to anoint the most holy person or place. Scholars are divided on it. I got a little annotation here. Or most holy place or most holy one. So either one or both, okay? So there's gonna be an anointing that takes place. Verse 24. Then he goes into verse 25, which we're gonna get to in a minute. Let's break down verse 24. Let's go in order. So he begins... Uh, and I, I want to talk about it. Um, it. It can get confusing if you don't take it in chunks. So let's look at, first off, 77s, they're decreed for a specific group of people. Let's deal with that first. So he says in verse 24, 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city. Okay. So this time period that he's talking about, that's coming. Like this is decreed. It's going to finish a lot of stuff, but... This time period is for a specific group of people and for a specific place, which is Daniel's people. So we're talking about the people of Israel. We're not, we're not talking about Gentiles. We're not talking about Muslims, modern day Palestinians. We're not talking about descendants of Ishmael. We're not talking about descendants of uh, Esau. We're not talking about just, you know, Arabs. We're not talking about white people. We're not talking about Asians. We're not talking about, all those people are great. Okay, just everybody has got a story and it's all wonderful. But this is specifically about the land of Israel. And if, you're, if you've been around the church, if you're, you've been around prophecy, you hear people talk about Israel and everybody always wonders, why, why so much about Israel? Um, I don't wanna go off on a tangent here, but if you go through the book of Romans, um, chapters one through eight, Israel is in there and that story. And, but it's really about the new covenant and chapters one through eight and, and justification and, and regeneration and, and sanctification and all that. But then when he comes down to chapters nine, 10 and 11, it's about Israel, Romans. It's, 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 it's about the people of Israel and their part to play in all of this. And then um, Ephesians is the same thing. You have our inheritance in the first two chapters of this letter to the church in Ephesus. And he goes in and talking about the integration of Israel which is an old covenant people, but they're still part of, there's this plan we are engrafted into them. And so Israel is not like done away with, is, was what I'm trying to say. And if you go through the New Testament, look at all the places where Israel is described, it's really, really significant. They have an end times part to play. I want you to go back if you're new to all this and watch some of our older videos in this series of eschatology, in, which means end times. Go back and look at our, our, our walking through of Romans chapter 11 and um, Paul's teaching on specifically, um, you know, God's, God's promise to the patriarchs, you know, and, and the land of Israel. Jesus is coming back over there. He's not coming to America. It's not like he's coming to Washington, D.C., okay? He's, he's coming back over there. That's his land. Uh, and so Israel has a, has a part to play in all of that. So we got some other videos, the land of promise. We go through that whole thing. Um, you can't forget that going into these in this next series of, of videos. This is all big one you know, mess of 20 videos. So this is for your people, verse 24, this chunk of time called 77s, which we're going to explain in a minute. It is for the people of Israel and the land of Israel. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, the purpose, as we just said, was several things, and you should study each of these. Gail Evers does in her course. I think uh, Craig Keener did some in his course. I don't know if he did, I don't know how much he did in Daniel or not. I, I might be getting him confused, but I know he did one in Revelation that I took out of Asbury, but I, I believe he did some 
in Daniel. But irregardless, I know Gail Evers did, and it's really neat, the word studies here, because um, transgressions and sin are two, two aspects of sin, okay? Um, so the purpose of this period of time, okay, given to the people of Israel and the land of Israel is to seal up, it's to finish uh, transgression, sin, wickedness, everlasting righteousness, <laughs> righteousness, uh, vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy one and the most holy place, which is, you know, the Messiah and the land of Israel. So we've got the, we've got the uh, people and the purpose. Um, the start, when we get to, when we get to, you know, verses 24, 25, and 26, um, and the decree with the, the decree for, um, the timing of this, you have, you have this time period, 70 weeks of years um, that are for the people of Israel, of course, and the land of Israel, and then there's the purpose. When does this work? I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at the, I'm gonna look at the, what the 70 weeks are next, but there's a time period that he starts talking about when you come down into verse 25, because he begins to break down the 70 weeks, uh, the 77s, he'll do that in verse 26. So you're kind of, when you first read this, it's, it's difficult to talk about it because he throws out 77s in verse 24 and you're like, what's that? And then he gets through all the stuff in verse 24, which is really important and verse 25, which is extremely important. And then he deals with some of the breakdown and, and what we mean by 77s in verse 26 into verse 27. So this time period for the people of Israel and the land of Israel, okay, for all this purpose stuff, it's, um, it has a start. It's a start, the time period, it's a start of something. And so let's look at the start of this. He says in verse 25, know and understand this. That's important language. From the issuing of the decree, okay, so there's going, this time period is going to have a starting point and it's at the issuing of a decree. The problem is there are two specific decrees that are involved for Israel going back into the land. Let me say this here, because I don't think I said all this as good as I want to say it. There's a time period called 77s. It's for the people of Israel and the land of Israel to finish all this stuff. It has a starting period, and it's at the starting period is when a decree is given. The problem is there's two decrees. What it reads in verse 25 is, no one understand this from the issuing of the decree. And what's the decree? To restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Pause. So it's a starting point. The 77s begin in a starting point of an issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. This is what I'm not going to go into. The first decree, which you can get confused with if you were to map out a timeline of this, Okay, people like trace these old 77s when we get down to what that is and what that means and all that. They are, they're going to be like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't lead to this specific time period. Well, it's because did you start from the first decree or the second decree? The first decree is given in Ezra chapters, well, chapter one, and it was the, it was the decree to build a temple. Uh, King Cyrus said, Hey, man, I'm going to, God has laid it to me to go back and build, rebuild his temple. There's this decree given and chapters one through seven, by the time you get to chapter seven, the temple's rebuilt, but they have all this opposition and it is just crazy in detail. You should read it. It's really important, but they go back and finally the temple is rebuilt. Probably, you know, who knows how many years it took, but it, it took a while to get that done. I don't want to speculate because there's, there's opinions on that. But chapters one through seven in Ezra of Ezra give us the issuing of the decree to rebuild the temple. That's not the decree in verse 25. The decree in verse 25 is, is to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That decree happens after the temple was rebuilt. Uh, and that's talked about in the book of Nehemiah. Chapters one and two give us the story of Nehemiah and Artaxerxes and him going in and 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 that whole deal of God that's moving Nehemiah and 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 Artaxerxes' heart and um, who's the emperor in, in, in uh, Persia, uh, the Media Persian Empire, and he gives a decree which happens to be in the month of Nisan, the fifteenth of Nisan to be precise, to go back and rebuild the city. 
And there's opposition throughout the whole book of Nehemiah and talks about Ezra's role and all of that. So Ezra and Nehemiah is really important in the journey and the transition of the people of God leaving you know, Babylon underneath Medio Persia at that time, but Babylon and they're going back into the land. And, and all of the difficulties that went on, you know, the repopulation of some of the land, which is where you get the whole uh, Samaria and the Samaritan kind of population that begins and, and the contention between them and Jews. Like there's a massive story there that we see in the gospels. Okay. I don't want to go through all of that, but you, you're going you're gonna to, if you honestly, if you want to work through this, you're going to have to work through all of that. Okay, so there's a decree given for this period of time and it has a starting point and the starting point is for the, you know, rebuilding of Jerusalem. Uh, how does it read again? Uh, for the rebuilding, uh, restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, so having said that, verse 20, 25 says, no one understand this from the issuing of that decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one. That's language throughout the Old Testament that means Messiah, okay? Hands down, that's what that means. So from the issuing of that decree until Jesus comes, he says, um, the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens, 62 sevens, and then it, which is the city, will be rebuilt with streets, and a trench, but in times of trouble. So from the time of the issuing of the decree, not, not when they get back and actually build the city, but from the, the, the command that was given, the decree that was given to go back and get the city ready, from that time until Jesus comes, you have seven sevens and 62 sevens. And so seven sevens and 62 sevens equal, this is where we need to talk about the sevens. Yeah, this is where you talk about the sevens. Okay, so we have the issuing of the decree. When you talk about the time, it's really it's really strange language. Um, first off, 70 means 70, so that's easy, there's 70 sevens. But the term sevens is shah, <laughs> help, I'm not great with Hebrew, shah bu ha, shah bu ha. <laughs> I practiced, no good at saying that, shah bu ha. And that's the word seven. It's plural in our passage, but both the singular and the plural mean the same thing, just one singular and one plural. It can mean um, day, like seven days. It can be used week, seven weeks, or year, seven years. Um, so it's it can mean day, week, or year. Terms in scripture, just like in English, have their meaning, they get their meaning based on context. Same as this one. Context will determine whether this word, Shabuah, is either a day, a week, or a year. The context is. Again, English is the same way. Run, for example. R-U-N, run, the term run. Uh, it can describe, you know, I'm going to go for a run. Uh, my nose, once in a while, will run. Uh, I run things through my mind once in a while. See, depending how that term is used in the context in which it's used, gives it its own specific uh, definition. Very similar, obviously, to biblical language because all languages function that way. Context is extremely important. Important. You don't take things out of context. So this term is used to describe, um, you know, seven of something. Okay, which is whether it be seven days, seven weeks, or seven years. In this context, just to give you the short answer, and you can search it out yourself, uh, and the material and the people that I've recommended that you read will tell you this, it's, it's years, okay? Primarily because if it was weeks or if it was days, this whole deal would have been gone a long time ago, okay? Um, even years, it, there's some problems if you didn't have the breakdown of it, but it's definitely years, it's not weeks or days, okay? So 77s means that there's 70 weeks of years. <clears throat> so. If you take 70 weeks of years, that's obviously 490 years. Seven times 70 is 490. So there's 490 years. So let's go back up real quickly to verse 24. And, you, and when we read 77s, we'll just say 490 years. So Gabriel comes and says, this is super important. There are 490 years left for your people in the city. And Daniel's like, seriously, 490? You know, probably seems a long time to him, but you and I are like, well, that 
That 490 years would have ended about, you know, you know, 2000 years ago. Okay. What's, what's the slow up here? Okay. We're going to get to that. But he says, there's, there's 490 years for your people, your city to finish all this stuff. And then he says the 490 years start verse 25 at the issuing of this decree, not to go build the temple under Cyrus. That's in Ezra. And that wasn't the issuing of the decree. The decree was under uh, Artaxerxes through Nehemiah to rebuild the city. That's when the time clock started 490 years from that point of time. When you come down, that's, that sounds super clear to me. I think, I think that's, I think that makes sense. Hope. So when you come down to verse um, uh, 62, he says, now there's going to be divisions. There's going to be like things that happen in these 490 years. There's I said four. There's three parts to this division. The first part, he says, um, verse 26. No, no, no. Sorry. Verse 25. Okay. No one understand this from the issuing of that decree to restore and build Jerusalem until the anointed one, the Messiah comes. Okay. You're going to have seven sevens. That's 49 years. And then you're going to have 62 sevens, which is 434 years, which leaves seven years left. You're going to have that amount of time until Jesus comes. Then it says um, that the city will be rebuilt with streets, a trench, but in times of trouble. Now let's pause here real quick. Um, actually, well, hold on. Let's look at verse 26, because this is where Sir Robert Anderson gets involved. Um Verse 26 says, after those 62 sevens, so you have the, the, the 49 years and the 434 years, after that period of time when the Messiah comes, Gabriel says, the anointed one, the same guy that's going to come up in verse 25, will be cut off and will have nothing. He dies. Prophetic announcement of the death of the Savior, of the Messiah. Okay, so he's going to die. Sir Robert Anderson, this is what I want you to go through. I, I'm just not going to do it in these videos. It just takes too long. And I'm just, I mean, I could do it, but I'm not as, it's, oh, I mean, these guys are really good who, who worked all this out. Um, the timing involved includes using the Israel calendar, which was a 30 day a month calendar. If you remember that, we dealt with all of that back in, I forget which video it was. I think it was the third video where we looked at the timing issue when they come out of Egypt, God's changed their calendar year because they were not going to be like Egypt and worship the sun God and, and just be on this kind of like mechanical deal. God's like, you're on my time frame. Remember we went through that? Go watch that video. It's really important. And so, you know, there's that had to be calculated. That had to be taken into, you know, uh, into an account on this timing. Because if you were to look at the issuing of the decree and then take the 49 years and the 434 years, and you were to go all the way up to, you know, the time when Jesus was crucified, which was in the month of Nisan, the, uh, the 15th of Nisan in AD 33, we're really specific on that date. Like we're pretty sure of that, like very, very, very sure of that. Um, I mean, again, <laughs> we know all about this kind of date here. I mean, we have a calendar based on the birth of Jesus and that calendar was within like a couple years, but the, we know the 15th of Nisan was the Passover when Jesus was crucified in AD 33. Like we can nail that down. Okay. So from the issuing of the decree till that point, and we know when the decree was issued, like it's, it's given there in the, in the month of Nisan, the 15th day of Nisan. So from the issuing of that decree until Jesus was crucified. You have 49 years and then 434 years. And, and Sir Robert Anderson and those other boys, like with the adjustment of the calendar and going all the way up, they, they walk you through that whole thing, which is just beautiful. Okay. So all of that's important, but that's really not what I'm interested in because we're way past all of that. What I'm interested in is the rest of verse 26 and verse 27. I hope you understand that. I almost stopped the video at this point and said, okay, we're going to have another video, but I don't want to go through this again. And we can just jump into the rest of it, which won't take too long. Okay. We good. So at the last half of verse 26, after the anointing one is cut off, what about this final seven? Because you have seven sevens and 62 sevens which is of course 69 years, there's 70. So we have one seven left with a seven year period. What about that last seven year period? Where did it go? We know that the Israel's cut off. Listen to what it says after you know that little statement in verse 26. The people 
of the ruler who will come. It's not the ruler who will come. This is a different ruler than the anointed one. He's not called the anointing one. Uh, he's not called the anointed one. He's, he's, that individual will be known as the man of lawlessness. That's what Paul calls him or the antichrist. Okay. That's who will be described in chapter 10, 11, and 12 in Daniel as Gabriel's going to come back and walk him through all of that. So the, but the people of that guy, which we know from history was Rome, the Roman empire, which was basically all of Europe and a whole massive area up there, Turkey, all of that, you know, uh, I mean, I, Persia, which used to be, now is Iran, all of that somewhere, that guy is going to come out of that group. That's the people that was, you know, destroyed the city in AD 70. So that's a huge piece. The people of that guy will come and destroy the city that happened in AD 70 and the sanctuary. And then it says the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. Desolations have been decreed. So it's not the end right then, but the end is going to come like a flood. It cannot be stopped. War is going to continue until that point of time. And then he talks about the last seven years. Verse 27, he who's that ruler of the people who destroyed the city in AD 70, which was Rome, he will confirm a covenant not with Israel, but with many for one seven, but it will pertain to Israel. And that's the final seven years of human history, which we call the tribulation period. It should actually be qualified. And he actually does this for us in verse 27, that there's two parts to this final seven years. There's the tribulation and then there's the great tribulation. We're going to get to that in the book of Revelation, which is in the following videos. But he says he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. And in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifices and offerings. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the decree is poured out on him. Okay. So in the middle of that, he's going to cause an abomination that causes desolation. I want to say one quick thing on this. If you were to go back, Israel enters into the land, back into the land after leaving Babylon. And the first, you know, seven years, because remember, there'll be seven sevens and then 62 sevens. The first seven years or the se seven weeks of years is 49 years. Scholars are divided, but it probably means that uh, it took 49 years to at least get the city livable. I mean, you, you can go through the book of Nehemiah. The temple's already been rebuilt. And then Nehemiah's, man, pouring resources, taking stuff back, leading the people back. Everybody goes back that will come back. And they establish themselves in the land of Israel. But not everybody does. We'll have this whole group, which I don't want to go into, but we have this whole group called the diaspora that um, comes to Israel, um, you know, even in the time of Jesus, who stayed back in Babylon. They were happy. They had a synagogue there. I mean, they they had a house, had a job, you know, loved the YMCA. We're not going back to Israel. That happened. But there was a huge people that went back, Who group of people that went back to the land of Israel. Probably took 49 years to rebuild the city. You can learn all about that in the book of Nehemiah. It's awesome. Okay, 49 years. But then from that 49 year period, if the city was rebuilt, you had 434 years, those other 62 sevens, that took you all the way through this intertestamental period. So after like Malachi, Zechariah, these the last of the prophets, there was like 400 years where there was no prophet and God did not speak. Those are called the intertestamental period. That's that's the intertestamental period. That's, you, you know... Um, in the Catholic scriptures, they have the Apocrypha. You have all these books that were written, history books during that time. And in the Catholic Bible, those are included. They're not as authoritative as our Bible, but they're a history that's included as kind of an appendix to theirs. However you want to look at that. But I'm telling you that because in that time period, specifically in the Maccabean time period, um, they had this, this oppressor. Uh, called Antichius Epiphanes. And he comes in and, and basically does what verse 27 does. Uh, he comes into the temple and does an abomination that causes desolation. And there's no one really says this anymore, but there's, there have been a group of scholars, um, you know, that have said, okay, that's the fulfillment of this. Um, that this, all this stuff, you, and you may have heard this with Revelation, all that stuff is talking about something in the past. Well, first off, the book of Revelation was written after Daniel. 
and uh, um, in this fulfillment of this prophecy in Matthew 24, Jesus himself talks about the debt. Uh, let me let me look this up. I didn't actually um, save this, but in Matthew 24, I think it's verse 16. No, verse 15. Jesus, this is after obviously the Maccabean rebel. This is after the intertestamental testamental period when Jesus comes before he's crucified. He says, when you see standing in the holy place, when you see, in other words, this is future, the abomination that causes desolation spoken through the prophet Daniel. So he's like, remember what Daniel said? Now that wasn't fulfilled through Antichius Epiphanes. Okay. And some of the people that I've given you specifically, Gail Evers walks you through that event and shows how that's not this event. Okay. So Jesus says, um, when you see that event, Again, he doesn't tell you when it's going to happen, but when you see it, do this. Okay. So prophecy is not given. So you'll know when it'll happen, but that when it happens, you'll know that it happened. And he says, when you see this, let the reader understand, get out, understand what's happening. Then let those who are in Judea, Judea flee to the mountains. Okay. Know what's taking place. Everything Daniel was talking about. And when you begin to move through those past, dude, run. That's what Jesus says. So the idea of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, being a fulfillment of something that happened in the past is not true. There will be a covenant by this guy in the future with Israel. He's going to go into the temple. There's going to be a temple. People say, oh, there's not going to be a temple. There's going to be a temple. Has to be a temple. Because he's going to go in and he's going to sacrifice an animal. He's going to probably, you know, whatever it was. I think Antichius Epiphanes did a, a hog or a pig or something, but he's going to create the abomination that causes desolation in the middle of the tribulation period. Um, and uh, there's going to be an end that is decreed out upon him. 41 minutes. <sighs> that is Daniel's 70 weeks or Deb Daniel's 70 weeks of years or the 490 years that has three parts has 49 years, 434 years, and seven years. It is a huge timepiece in prophecy. What I'm concerned about, there's a lot there we could have spent. I was looking at this, you guys, when I was like, how do I teach this? Um, I mean, there's obviously, I think Gail Evers is like 19 weeks or something over this course. It's ridiculous. But like most people, when they're dealing with, with chapter nine, I mean, Sir Robert Anderson wrote a whole book just on this chapter. I mean, so there's a lot there. I, I, I want you to be serious about it and study it. I think it's important. But um, what I'm concerned about going into the next video series of videos, which is Revelation, I want to look at those seven years, which is the emphasis for the book of Revelation, specifically when you get into chapter six, but it spills before it into chapter four and five. And then chapters one through three prepare you. So um, over the next several weeks, Lord willing. I might throw in some videos here and there, uh, but over the next several weeks, I'd like to go through Revelation chapters 1 through 22 and look at this prophecy of Daniel as John sees it. Um, now, let me say one more thing before I let you go. Um, I covered this in a couple different videos. When you look at these three you know, the 490 years, these 70 weeks, they're divided up into three parts. Again, 49 years, um, 434 years, and then seven years. And you're like, why the divisions? Well, the first two were congruent. 49 years, the temple was done. And then, then of course, there was 434 years. Okay. Um, but there was a break for nearly 2,000. It's been 2,000 years. And the last seven hasn't started. But we know from the text that it's going to start at the signing of a covenant. So it's a break. You're like, why, why, why was there a break? Well, if you watched our video covering Romans chapter 11, there was the age of, of the, you know, this age or time of the Gentiles that Paul refers to that Israel, you know, basically was hardened in part. And there was this break why the fullness of the Gentiles come in, which is the church age, which will come to an end and lead to a essentially a rapture point, which we're going to talk about. I don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. We're going to go through part of the tribulation. We'll talk about that. But there is this time period um, that before the seven years starts, and it's been going on a long time. But we know the time clock 
for that seven years gets close when we see Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, and 39, which we did not cover in our videos. And there's a number of reasons for that. But when Israel becomes a nation in, in Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37, because uh, while he's in, in Babylon, um, Ezekiel is prophesying to them. Um, the whole book of, of Ezekiel is what's going on during the exile during the exile in Babylon, uh, Ezekiel is, is prophesying to the people of Israel. And part of that is, is talking about um, what's going to happen in the future, specifically in 1948, uh, May 17th, I think, when uh, Israel became a nation in a day, fulfillment of prophecy. So that's a major timepiece. So all of this is really significant. It's, it's kind of a larger narrative. But the focus is the seven years of tribulation and after this big time period. You can also see this big gap between, you know, the first, you know, what is it, 69 weeks and then the last week, 69 weeks of sevens and the last, you know, seven years of, tri you know, seven years of human history. That gap there is also described in, um, the seven mosaic feast video that we did, which I think is the second or third video that we did um, in this series on this channel. And we're looking at the seven mosaic feasts. There were four spring feasts, which Jesus fulfilled to the day. And then there were three fall feasts. They represented his first coming and his second coming. And again, there's the summer months. There's that middle time period which we see now is the period in which we're living. See, God, God has explained this in several things. So as we go through all of this study, I'm hoping as you watch it and probably hopefully watch it a few times, you can go back and begin to put some of this together and study it yourself and say, oh, I see what's going on. I see what it's doing. I hope you love this as much as I do. We're living in great days. This is great material. And I want to give you as much as I can so you can study it and come to your own conclusion. And I believe in you. All right, see you next time.